Hey friends, we're going to talk about endpoint detection and response, or EDR. EDR has really come to its own over the last couple of years. It started out as a new category just a few years ago, evolving from the need to have visibility into endpoints rather than just protective services, which is what traditional antivirus, anti-malware does for you, into more of a threat detection service for your endpoint. So let's take a look at what the capabilities are. So we're going to talk about what EDR is, high-level overview, what some of the core capabilities are, and then who needs EDR. Now, before we get going, I want to quickly introduce myself. My name is Steve Murphy. I'm a vice president at ARG. And I just want to make clear that this is my own video, not necessarily one sponsored by my employer. So the views and opinions expressed here are my own. So let's get going. So what are EDR must-haves? Gartner defined some key components a couple of years ago. This list is a little dated, but let's start with it as a baseline. Gartner says that an EDR has to provide data for incident search and investigation. It also needs to identify suspicious activity. It's kind of the core capability that we're, that we're hoping for. Threat activity has to be confirmed, and then it has to have some sort of alert triage, meaning how do you handle each individual alert type. Event chaining and data exploration are another key element of an EDR. Separates it from some of the other endpoint protection services that are on the market. And then the ability to take action on a threat. So this, this involves automation. So let's take a look at a current list. Today's EDRs have to have more capability. Yes, they're still going to have that ability to protect and monitor your endpoints for malicious activity. But today's EDRs incorporate most of today's anti-malware, antivirus, and endpoint protection platform services. And I'll just say a lot there, but there are a couple different categories that EDRs have been able to accommodate and evolve into incorporating into their core services. They have to consistently evaluate endpoint behavior. It means real time, it means online and offline, and then it has to be able to take action, and a pretty aggressive action when necessary. It, sure, you want it to be able to alert you when there's something going on on an endpoint, but we also want it to be able to kill, delete, and possibly even roll that endpoint back to restore it to a clean version of itself. Now, EDR is all about speeding time to resolution after an incident. The dwell time on corporate networks right now still exceeds 200 days, according to most research. And so being able to detect the silent threats that come through our traditional uh, endpoint protection platforms is really critical. The ability to speedily resolve these threats will make all the difference in whether or not you just have an event or an actual breach. So that's EDR at a high level. Let's take a look at some of the core features. So signature-based antivirus, anti-malware is now incorporated in most mainstream EDR platforms. That's bringing in the services of the traditional antivirus, anti-malware that everyone has installed on their endpoints and really providing an additional layer of security to what EDRs used to provide. Also, EDRs today provide personal firewalls, including intrusion detection and intrusion protection services. So we want to be able to monitor the network attached to that endpoint and otherwise protect that endpoint from potential malicious traffic. Data loss prevention is another non-traditional EDR feature that most platforms have today. For example, the ability to turn off a USB drive on a machine to prevent people from plugging in or exfiltrating data onto a personal device. Behavioral analytics are really core to the EDR value proposition. The AI and machine learning ML services that EDR provides are second to none in terms of identifying those silent threats that can get through some of the defensive measures that EDR includes. We also want the ability, as I mentioned previously, to restore to a clean version. And event chaining is critical for our security operations center to be able to remediate, hunt down threats, and ensure that the rest of the organization is protected. Application and user control. You want to establish good controls over the endpoint and be able to determine and restrict the services that the end user has access to. You want to be able to isolate an endpoint while you're working on it, prevent it from talking to other endpoints on the network, but you still want full access to that endpoint for your remediation work. Visualization and reporting, as I mentioned before with this CloudStrike screenshot, really helps the Security Operations Center 
understand what's happening on that endpoint and resolving troubles quickly. And then lastly, it should be cloud enabled. While you want your agent to work while the endpoint is both online and offline, you want the bulk of the processing to happen off device in the cloud so we're not taking up resources of the device. So I've mentioned the Security Operations Center a couple times. What should EDR provide specifically to the SOC to help them do their jobs? Well, first of all, we want to know what else might have been in contact with that endpoint. If we're troubleshooting an event, of course, we want to remediate that particular device, but we also want to know who else has interacted with that device. We want to know what uh, changes have occurred on that device so we can determine whether or not those changes were valid or maybe part of the threat event. We want to understand what files have been created on that endpoint over the course of the event, what processes have been running, and what other network activity has happened, like DNS requests, additional connections, open ports, and so forth. Now lastly, we want all of that information provided in a historical context. That event chaining is really critical to our security analysts for them to be able to evaluate and treat not only that specific endpoint, but determine what else has been impacted. So lastly, let's take a look at who needs EDR. Well, it's easy to say everyone needs an EDR. Everyone is subject to the threats that are out there today, but some people need it more than others. So if you have a traditional antivirus, anti-malware solution on your endpoints, you're probably feeling pretty safe. EDR replaces those traditional AM, AV solutions and upgrades you into a more holistic, more behavioral approach rather than just a defensive signature-based approach. If you have a lot of remote or mobile workers, people who are working outside of your core defensive perimeters, EDR can be a great value proposition. Most people don't have fantastic visibility into their endpoints, so EDR provides that visibility and control elements to help you manage your endpoints more effectively. If you want automated response capabilities, so you don't want to wait until you can address an alert that's come through, EDR is a great solution with a lot of built-in automation. And also, if you have significant property exposure, by that I mean intellectual property, custodial property, maybe you house other people's information, or you have significant regulatory frameworks that you have to meet. Now, I put high-value users on this list. Who doesn't have a high-value user to support? But here, we're really talking about people who can be significantly impacted by an endpoint outage, by their personal computer um, being infected and what might, might do to the organization. Of course, we're talking about senior executives. We're talking about salespeople, people who have core positions within the workflow that really can't afford any downtime or those effects ripple through the organization. And then lastly, if you have uh, current solutions that are slowing down your computers, being able to offload some of that computational workload out into the cloud makes a lot of sense. So the EDR market has been evolving extremely rapidly. Traditional EDR providers are adding new capabilities to include traditional antivirus, con uh, traditional EPP services, other security mainstays that provide solutions in other categories are moving into the EDR space and they're offering some interesting integration opportunities with their core capabilities. So this is just a, a very short list of the logos that are participating in the EDR community. My personal preference are to focus on the ones that have strong SASE or Secure Access Service Edge stories because I think that is going to be the future of end user security. So get introducing something that is consistent with that SASE framework is going to set you up to future proof your security posture moving forward. So what are some of your next steps? Well, first of all, personal favor, I'd ask that you give me a thumbs up, click the red button to subscribe. And lastly, if you're interested in EDR and want to have a quick conversation, I'm completely open to doing that. Uh, I've got my email up and you can certainly use that and let me know if you have any questions. And with that, I appreciate your time and I hope you have a great day. Thanks very much.